Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Goody. I'm the current vice chair of uh, OBC Oriental Bird Club. It's great to see so many OBC members and non-members joining today's webinar. This is the second OBC webinar. Uh, many of you will have joined us for the, um, the Spring Build Sand update in March, which was the first one we've run, and we're planning uh, quite a few more over the coming months. If you miss the Spoonie um, piece and want to rewatch that, you can find it on OBC's YouTube channel. Um, that webinar was all about conservation and the survival of a particular species. Today's a little bit different. Uh, we're going to talk about a specific country, uh, that country being Taiwan. We've got three speakers today. Um, firstly, Dali Lin uh, from the Taiwan Endemic Species Institute and Scott Persner from the Taiwan Wild Bird Federation uh, are going to take you through conservation issues and successes. And then OBC's gold sponsor, Rock Jumper Birding Tours, will showcase the special birds and birding sites in Taiwan. So Glenn Valentine from Rock Jumper joins us to present today. Welcome, Glenn. I'm excited to be able to announce that OBC will be partnering with Rock Jumper to offer an OBC sponsored tour to Taiwan in May 2022. And you're going to hear more about that during Glenn's talk. Um, before we press on, I just wanted to thank all our members for their patience while we get our publication issues resolved. We have a new and expanded publications team uh, headed up by Alex Berryman, and I believe this will have everything up to date and on track by the end of this year. Uh, Alex has promised us BA35 will be ready by middle of July. That's the next issue of Birding Asia. No pressure, Alex, but uh, he assures us we're, uh, we're on time. We also have a new conservation team headed up by Paul Insturakau. Um, the team is already having an amazing impact on OBC's conservation work. We've increased our grant giving uh, from less than $29,000 in 1999 to $75,000 in 2020, a big increase, particularly in the last year. We're focusing our funding now on the species that need it most. The latest Birding Asia highlights some of the areas where we've been active. And Paul and his team have done great work in building partnerships with like-minded organisations such as Asian Species Action Partnership, uh, the European Association of Zoos and Aquaria and the World Pheasant Association. We're also working closely of course with our partners at BirdLife International. All of these partners are aiming to ensure that OBC doesn't operate in isolation and that our efforts form part of the bigger conservation picture. We have some recent great examples of how ABC is helping the Asian songbird crisis in Indonesia by supporting captive breeding programs, community education and protection efforts for the threatened island species. Which is where you come in. If you want to help, uh, you can make a donation at www.orientalbirdclub.org forward slash donate. Or if you're not already a member, please join OBC at the end of the webinar at www.orientalbirdclub.org forward slash join. Every new member will help us to do more conservation, conservation work in the region. Well, enough chat from me. Uh, let's crack on with the program. Uh, we do hope to have enough time to uh, have some questions at the end. If you want to uh, post a question, use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screens. So the Q&A tab to post a question for any of our speakers today, uh, if you'd like to ask a question. And now it's my pleasure, firstly, to introduce um, Dali Lin from the Taiwan Endemic Species Institute. Welcome, Dali. And Dali is going to talk to us today on the state of Taiwan's birds. Dali, over to you. Hi, Chris. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar. I'm Dali, I'm Dali Lin from Taiwan. And today I will give an introduction about um, the state of Taiwan's birds. And this is the first uh, Taiwan's national report to talk about the state of the birds and we published in 2020. Yes, ju just the last year. And we just talk about some important points and some highlights. And if you want to know the detail, all the materials are open and you can download that free um, on the website. And I think the webinar will share the link with you. And if you are interested in any details, it's very welcome to contact me. Yeah. And here, I just um, talk about some content about the status of Taiwan Spurs and how we design that and follow the forwards when and we update to do. And we now also share some 
new information from the new analysis of results. Okay, um, okay. Um, I'm Dali, I'm just a step of Taiwan's government. Um, endemic, endemic Species Research Institute is one of the governmental institute. And I work, work here um, for almost 10 years. Yeah. Um, I'm the public servant there. And I also a bird watcher since 2000, 2001. So it's almost be a bird watcher for 20 years. Unfortunately, I have not been to Europe and also the UK. So I think that I have not got any common European birds there. Um, and when I was a child, just uh, grew up with many, um, many, many comics books in, in the governmental institute and launched uh, several city and, city and science projects. There's a breeding bird survey and the Ta um, Taiwan New Year bird count to count the wintering birds and, and also the eBird Taiwan. And now I'm also um, enjoying writing over 90 popular science articles and 10 popular science books translation. And I'm also the dad, a dad with two kids. They are the, actually the little monster in the living room. So they are now also noisy in the living room. So if you hear, if you hear their noise from the background, I'm sorry for that. Okay. It is Taiwan. It's the subtropical subtropical island in the mountainous island in East Asia, and it's not the very big island, but this is with um, um, uh, many mountains with high elevation. So this in this area is can contain the so high diverse of a wild bird in this area, uh, like uh, some species from from Indochina or some species from China or from Tembridge, they can find their habitat in the Opai region or some species can find their habitat in the plain area or rolling hill. But, and the land composition is about about 56% are native or artificial forest because the most of most of the land are covered is by Mountain area, so this is most of our most of the land are covered by forest, and about twenty one percent is agriculture, and also include the other land use type. But um, so far we have um, twenty three million people here, so you can you can see that um, the Taiwan stands almost covered by forest and agriculture and the land competition is very high in Taiwan. So the issue of land use competition and for the natural habitat is the most important, one of the most important issue for biodiversity conservation and also for the wild birds. And the state of Taiwan's birds we published in 2020, um, if we talk about the story from the initial story, the, um, the most important part is in 2009, we launched our first city and science project called the Taiwan Breeding Bird Survey. And this Breeding Bird Survey have conducted over 10 years. And this is a very important timing for us to publish the result of the, um, to publish the result of Taiwan's, from Taiwan's data and the state of Taiwan's birth. You can see the cover of the report is a Taiwan's bubble. It's an endemic bubble and just uh, disappears in eastern part of Taiwan. And the report we highlighted that we have already recorded six, six and 74 bird species in Taiwan. And we found that the 52 species are threatened. And there are also um, seven number of certain species is increased so far. And we now, um, when we published the report, we have 29 endemic species, but now we got the 30 endemic species. And we also noticed that 15 migratory water birds, their numbers are, they have declined. And so far we estimate that we have about 3000 volunteers and e-birders who contribute their observations to our city and science database. And like on the e, if we, <coughs> We accumulate, um, we accumulated four and fifty thousand complicated bird, e bird checklists since 1972. And here is the draft uh, when it's the first draft I designed to how to plan the report of Taiwan State of Birds. You can see there is the basically is the the 
is the concept of con conservation prioritization. But um, however, the result of conservation prioritization is very um, important for by modeling or empirical data analysis. But here we just applied a little part of the concept. The first you can see the orange arrow here is talk about the national responsibility. And the sequence is the endemic species, endemic subspecies, and non-endemic residents, and then some other So The most important birds for us and the high national responsibility are those breeding birds. And then wintering visitors, transient migratory birds, and seabirds, vagrant, and others. And here is we, and <clears throat> we assessment uh, all the bird species in Taiwan uh, based on their status and the population trajectories. And you can see that it's a critical, um, critical endangered date, endangered date, vulnerable, and the near treatment date, and so on. And here's the report of the Taiwan's national red list. So it's based on the result of the Taiwan, Taiwan's red list. And this compared with the national responsibility. And this red arrow, you can see this is the result of the conservation prioritization here in, the, in this corner. When the species, if the species is endemic and is endangered, this is very urgent for this species because this is only disputes in Taiwan. And then if they are wintering and all this is concerned, so we will not put more efforts or more resources on the species conservation. Okay, so after this, uh, after this design, we just uh, represent the result of the state of birds like this. Here you can see there are so many circles. In this. Um, here, um, for the central circle is the total the total species we have six since 74 species and the endemic species here, endemic subspecies, non endemic species. These three, two, so this three circle is for all the breeding birds and also include the summer visitors here and then the winter species, transient migrants. So this is basically is designed based on the sequence of conservation prioritization. And here's the part uh, different colors talk about how many species and the proportion of the threatened level in this group. So here you can see that um, still some part of the endemic species and endemic subspecies or some breeding birds are also important for birds and they are also threatened. So this is for, uh, for Taiwan stakeholders and authorities it's important to take the conservation actions for those species. And here for our result, we can divide that for to three different parts. The first part, um, we are going to talk about the state and trends for Taiwan spurs. It will, so here is a talk about the different spurs group and those are group are based on the different city and science project. And later Scott will talk about that later. And include the breeding birds and migratory water birds, migratory raptors, and breeding terns. And also, we have some spe specific bird species and talk about the, their status and trends, like the black faced spoonbill or the Chinese chrysanthemum, and maybe some people care about the fairy pita or northern left wing. And all the details are included in our report. And we also talk about some major conservation issues that may, may impact on our bird species, like a climate change, invasive bird, invasive bird species, and poison increases, and like a seabird bycatch. And here is the main result for our breeding bird. I think here is some report. The left, the left part is talk about some breeding birds, their population are increased in recent 10 years. And this right part is some species, their population is decreased, decreased rapidly in recent 10 years. And notice that here most, most of the species are, we said funding birds or their prefers grassland. And now we are just la launching a new research to identify their habitat preference and try to build a multi-species indicators to just like in Europe or UK, we build the forest bird indicator and farm bird indicators to show the result of that. 
and here is the unpublished data I just show you because we are just trying to run the um, try to analysis the data again and by based on the different analysis result. And here you can see the most of the many there are many species of front end birds that decrease rapidly, like the shrike and drongle. Those species are you can say they are the predators in front ends that carry some different wildlife, but when their population is decreased, I think it's very worried about less. There are maybe the keystone species in the farmland ecosystems. And here are also the three, only three species of the breeding, breeding prinia in Taiwan, and like the wagtail and also the parabill, they also decrease rapidly. So here, I think it's very important alerts to show Taiwan's farmland have something wrong or some Threatened did affect their survivalship. So we think um, this is a very important alert for us. And here is also show some trends of showbirds in Taiwan, like the long tailed stings, little ring plover, with same piper, and the common snipe. And also migratory show, showbirds, uh, they are preferred uh, in the freshwater field, like the rice bedded rice field in Northeast Taiwan. And here, we not um, in recent years we noticed that the rice rice paddies also decreased rapidly in northeast Taiwan. And we are not very sure is this the result to make those species decrease rapidly. Um, we are not very sure, and we have tried to conduct the new research for that. But the results showed it less. The here is also the farmland loss or rice field loss also may impact those species which prefer the fresh water, <clears throat> fresh water wetlands. And like in Northeast Taiwan, there are so many new buildings and luxury house increased rapidly in Northeast of Taiwan. So we think the, this may be the, the, re the main reason make the species, <clears throat> make the species decrease rapidly in recent years. So, and another issue, this is new from Taiwan is the, <clears throat> the extent expansion of the solar panels. The solar panels try to find some, find some wetlands, <clears throat> find some wetland or wetland to, to put that solar panel and they can, then maybe a strong impact to affect the migratory showbirds and waterbirds and some waterfalls. Um, so here's the new issue about the conflict between the green energy and the wildlife conservation. So here, as so we can see that we post and when the government is try to extend, expand the solar panels, and if they try to choose the wetland or the showbird hotspot, we have to need to communicate and negotiate with the authorities and or stakeholders and try to find a better place to let them send the solar panels. And here is just another issue talk about the invasive species. When I just analysis the data of the breeding birds, we noticed that the invasive species like the feral dolph, Java minor, and Kama minor increased rapidly in Taiwan in recent 10 years. So it's another alert, but I, we think it's maybe very hard to remove those species. It's almost um, build a very stable population in Taiwan. But for another case like the Scattered ibis is going to remove remove it rapidly by garments. They just uh, kill them rapidly. So I think the curve of the ibis will be very different from these three invasive species. But we also have some good news for another species like the Savannah nightjars. The population is increased rapidly in recent years, and you can see the map between 2000 and 2020 and their population, their distribution is spent rapidly. And even in urban areas, it's very easy to find them. And like the Malayan net heron is going to be the example for the species. It's spent from their forest habitat and to the urban green space like the carp or on the campuses. So if you are very interested in, in this species or you want to bird in Taiwan, this fish may be going to be your first lifers in Taiwan, because when you get get off from the airport, you can and you check in in the hotel, you can just uh, visit and 
park or campus, you can find this species. And it's very hard to find in any part of the world like the Southeast Asia. But in Taiwan, it's very easy to find it in any park or green space in urban area. And another good news is for the black wing kinds. This is very rare species. Or we think the species just extend from a little part of Taiwan. But now, after 20 years, the population is, is expand rapidly in Taiwan. Almost everywhere with the wetland or farmland, it's very easy to find this raptor. So here we also have some good news for those species as the examples. And for the future world, we are trying to update the report every two years. And, and like the next year, we are going to re-evaluating the red list. We are going to update the list again and now we are trying to build in the multi-species you say indices or indicators we, we try to also have the have the forest bird indices or and uh, and the farm numbers index um because like the like the multi-species index is also present in many parts of the world especially in europe and north america but so far in asia there are there are no any any indices for like that. So here we just try to build the first uh, indices in Asia. And now we are also trying to include the row kill issue. It's going, this is the new city and science uh, launched in 2015. So we can try to announce the result of that. And the next report, we also talk about solar panel expansion. And we also try to build an agri environmental screen in Taiwan and try to fit for that. You know, there are so many screens from Europe and North America is fit to a temperate area, but here in subtropical Taiwan and with the complex terrain, we think there are so many small patch in farmland. So we think the agri environment scheme and the agricultural management and actions may be so different from Europe and North America. So we just try to find that um, to make have a win-win resource for crop production and the wildlife conservation. And we are trying to also improve our international cooperation with any part of the world or conservation with the migratory species. And hope we can have a new uh, good news and have a great up updated resource next year. And here we also accumulate huge amount of the open data for that is based on the, based on the, um, many volunteers from different part of Taiwan, they contributed so many observations on that. And all the records are um, stored on the Taiwan Biodiversity Network. It is also um, the main part of the database on Taiwan and all the data are open there. And in this database, only 87% of data are coming from, sorry, and this, uh, and the database about 80% is from the city and science projects. And you can see the eBird app here, you can see there is the highlight of the, it's a very bright bright spot from Asia is the Taiwan there. Are so many Taiwanese birds have contributed their observations, observations to eBirds. And we also upload, upload all our data and observation to GB. So here in the, annual meeting of GB if they are also notice that Taiwan is the open data hotspot in Asia. Yeah. So here we just uh, briefly talk about the result of the Taiwan's report and how we collect the, the, the status of our data. And we hope the next year we can update and publish a new Taiwan's the first report for everyone of the world. And we are so very welcome to everyone or international partner to contact us. If you, you think they have any opportunity to have a cooperation to conserve, to conserve the birds or wildlife and their habitat. And we are appreciate there are so many contributors for this report and the organizations and sponsors. Okay, thank you so much for your listening. And if you have any question, we have a Q and A section later. Thank you. Dali, uh, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, great to see Savannah Nightjar and Malay Night Heron doing well, uh, both birds that I first saw in Taiwan, uh, my visit to, to Taiwan.
Uh, many thanks for that mm. talk. It's time now to um, to hear from our second speaker. Uh, <laughs> Scott Persner is joining us today. Scott is the director of international affairs for the Taiwan Wild Bird Federation. And Scott is going to talk to us today on the people behind the paper, how civil society wrote the state of Taiwan's birds. Over to you, Scott. Hi everybody, uh, Scott Persner here from the uh, Taiwan Wild Bird Federation. First, I just want to say thank you to the OBC for uh, giving us the opportunity to go and uh, have this opportunity to share with everyone the state of Taiwan's birds and uh, the work that we've been doing here in Taiwan with citizen science as well as for bird conservation. So the title of my sp speech today is uh, The People Behind the Paper, How Civil Society Wrote the State of Taiwan's Birds. And I know it sounds a little bit dramatic, but uh, I it's a very important thing to note how civil society and how individual birders were really uh, important in the creation uh, of the state of Taiwan's birds and the kinds of citizen science projects and activities which we have in Taiwan for birds specifically. Before I go any further though, let me just uh, give a little introduction to my organization, the Taiwan Wild Bird Federation. We were founded in 1988 and our purpose is bird watching research and conservation. We actually serve as the umbrella organization for 21 different uh, bird and conservation uh, related NGOs throughout Taiwan and Taiwan's outlying islands. And so if we look here, you can just see a picture of all the different uh, partners which we have. Uh, we are in Taipei, but we have partners of our, our oldest partners such as the Wild Bird Society of Taipei were founded in 1973. And we uh, have big partners such as in the Kaohsiung Wild Bird Society and small partners such as the Wild Bird Society of Nanto, even partners in, um, uh, in Jimen Amatsu. And the thing is that all these groups are collecting data, all these groups are doing bird watching activities and things like that, which leads me to this next slide. If you look at the State of Taiwan's Birds 2020 report, much of the information comes from four distinct areas. You have the government institutes and you have academics, but a large chunk of it was from wild bird societies and NGOs as well as individual birders. Now for us serving as the umbrella organization for 21 different groups throughout Taiwan and outlying islands, we do have uh, our own NGOs, NGO goals, which we are trying to achieve, but at the same time, we have a network in place and that network uh, has been established and there is a structure there. So in the case of going ahead and doing citizen science projects, we are able to go ahead and share the information, receive information and discuss things and come to decisions uh, rather more quickly than if these were not in place. And because of that, we are also able to go ahead and contribute a lot more data to uh, these kinds of studies, such as to the uh, state of uh, the SOTB. And so just to go ahead and highlight the, uh, the critical role of citizen science, uh, it relied heavily on local residents and citizen scientists, especially the Taiwan Bird Record Database, which is the historical a bird record database, which we had been using in Taiwan prior to using eBird, and then of course eBird data itself. And just to show you how many people uh, contributed to the state of Taiwan's birds, it was nearly 3,900 people uh, and 472,000 checklists uh, on eBird, which is a lot of data for such a small country. Taiwan is extremely active, and I will get to that in another moment. And just as Dolly was saying about open data, the Taiwan Biodiversity Network has accumulated over 7.8 million bird observation records. In fact, in terms of open data and biodiversity observations, which are contributed to things like GBIF and TIBIF, Taiwan has, is number two in Asia uh, after, after India. And so that's a very high number. And it's usually surprising to people how much uh, uh, individual data comes from people and from open data sources. So now I just want to uh, show you some of the citizen science projects which we have in Taiwan for birds. As Dali had mentioned earlier, the, uh, the Breeding Bird Survey Taiwan, then we also have MAPS, then YBC, eBird. There's, there's a large list. This is just some of them. Uh, however, I will only talk about a few of them uh, today during my presentation. Yet some of these have been established for many, many years, going back over, over 10 years now. And especially with something like eBird, the data goes back even further. And to show you how much further it goes back, I'm gonna show you a piece of, uh, uh, oh, before I show you that piece of history, first I'll show you this uh, slide here, which goes and shows the number of birds uh, that are you know, categorized here in Taiwan and how they are actually in relation to the citizen science projects for Taiwan. So in terms of our winter visitors, we have the Taiwan NYBC, you have the breeding bird survey and maps which cover invasives, residents and summer visitors, as long as they're breeding birds. But then, 
all the bird species uh, that are occurring within Taiwan can be recorded using eBird. And now that being said, I wanted to show you this piece of history. Here you go. This is the uh, original background for the Taiwan Bird Record Database. Now the Taiwan Bird Record Database actually started in the mid 1990s, early to mid 1990s. However, prior to that, Taiwan already had a, a strong history of people doing bird observations and recording them in their own personal uh, records. And so they, after they had developed the Taiwan Bird Record Database in the TWBF office, I heard the story about how in the past there was one person with a computer. And so people would bring them their, uh, their checklists in order to go ahead and key in the, the data. And so the data went back all the way to 1972. And this is very important for looking at status and trends of certain bird species, uh, it, even into like the 1970s. And that was over 10,000 checklists. Now, those 100,000 checklists uh, were actually able to be put into the eBird database. Now, a little bit first about eBird Taiwan. eBird, if you don't know, is, the, uh, is a platform for recording your bird viewing observations. And it was developed in 2002 uh, between Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology and the Audubon Society. And so it's a great place to go ahead and record your uh, bird observations and share your checklists and go ahead and uh, communicate with other people throughout the world about the birds which you've seen. And in 2015, a uh, collaboration between the TESRI, Dolly, uh, the organization which Dolly works for, and the TWBF created the Taiwan portal, which is the traditional Chinese portal of eBird. And it attracted a number of people for personal birding and it helps them share their checklists with each other, with scientists and with the rest of the world. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of the saying Taiwan number one, but here we could be pretty proud of Taiwan number seven because Taiwan is number seven in the world for checklists. I had said that it was 472,000 um, checklists for the State of Taiwan Birds report. But now if you look at this top line here, this was actually this week, over 4,000 eBirders and over 553,000 checklists have been, uh, have, have been submitted to eBird. And so we have a very, very active eBird community here. And our organization, the, uh, the TWBF, we also host workshops for beginners that they could learn how to go ahead and record and share and join the community of, of, bird, of, of birders uh, throughout Taiwan and also throughout the rest of the world. Now, as Dolly was mentioning uh, in the status and trends of Taiwan's birds, a lot of the data there comes from citizen science data. And so if you look here at the breeding birds, that comes from, a lot of it comes from citizen science data as does migratory water birds, migratory raptors. So I'm going to just discuss for you right now a little bit about these uh, citizen science projects which we've developed that uh, are able to contribute to these topics. So in the case of the Breeding Bird Survey of Taiwan, BBS Taiwan, it was established in 2009 between uh, the National Taiwan University Institute for Ecological and Evolutionary Biology and the TWBF as well as uh, TESRI. And this was the first uh, systemic, systematic national scale citizen science project for Taiwan as well as a pioneering project for uh, Asia Pacific region. Taiwan has some of the oldest and most well-developed citizen science projects for birds in, in Asia. And so the reason why they did this is because they had wanted to use that information to establish a breeding bird population index. At first it was for about 160 species, but now it's already gone up to uh, 231 species. And this is conducted by point count between March and June uh, at different locations uh, throughout Taiwan. And they do different uh, uh, elevations. So you've got high elevation, mid elevation and lower elevation. And usually you have around 228 participants per year and 257 sampling sites. So you could see that uh, as of December, 2020, over 490 surveys had been done at over uh, 4,167 4, points. And so uh, there are courses which are held uh, for anyone who's interested in order to take part in the BBS. They also publish annual reports every year and all the data that is collected is open and uh, sent to GBIF. And so based off of this, they also developed a, a common uh, breeding bird index uh, that you could see if, uh, in the uh, SOTB uh, that looks at how over the last 10 years, any fluctuations or what's uh, the situation for breeding birds within Taiwan. And then next, for migratory bird species, we have the Taiwan New Year bird count. Now, the Taiwan New Year's bird count was established in 2013. So the winter of 2013 to 2014. 
and it's based on the Christmas bird count. However, Christmas is not as popular in Taiwan, so it became the Taiwan New Year bird count. And so prior to the 2013 count, there was a New Year's bird count, which is funny because if you look at the date at the bottom, it was actually over Christmas, but it was called still the New Year's bird count. Yet it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a nationwide bird count and it didn't cover all areas. And that was just between 1973 and 1984. However, after that, uh, people were doing and groups were doing individual studies, but yet there was no coordinated effort, systematic scheme for doing a, a, a water bird study. So the NYBC looks to go and accomplish that. So the NYBC's goal is to monitor the status of wintering uh, birds of Taiwan and surrounding islands, especially particularly water bird species, as, as Dolly was showing you. A lot of the information uh, that looks at how elan and farmlands might be affecting birds in the north eastern part of Taiwan, a lot of that comes from looking at the data which we've collected over the last five years from the NYBC. Now, the NYBC takes place over the course of a month between mid-December and mid-January with January 1st being its, uh, its midpoint and line, line transects, counting flocks and area searches are done. And in this, and as far as this, teams are supposed to go out in order to do it. And in terms of the teams, if you are one person that is able to, um, know what bird species you're looking at, record it well, and do all of the things involved, then one person can go. But it could be as many as 100 people. And it's actually become a very big community activity that many of our partners go and have events for, for the NYBC. And if you look at the bottom there, you have 2014 to 2019. Each year, a mascot is chosen. And do not worry, we do not make the birds wear scarves here in Taiwan. It's just, it's cute. It's cute. And each bird is actually selected, though, uh, for a specific reason. So, for instance, in 2019, the, uh, the Avocet, the Pied Avocet, was chosen as the mascot because they wanted to show that it's some good news that Pied Avocet numbers were going up in Taiwan. And so that's why it was chosen as uh, the mascot. However, for the 2020 version, five farmland uh, water birds were selected because their numbers were going down. And so here you could see NYBC by the numbers. Uh, we've steadily gone up in numbers of uh, sites over, over the years. In 2020, there was 176. Number of volunteers uh, in 2020 was 1,054. And you could see the, the abundance. Over 300,000 birds were counted and 20,000 records were recorded. And if you look at the bottom, you've got the TWBF as well as our partners, Wild Bird Society of Taipei and the Kaohsiung Wild Bird Society, besides TESRI and the SOTB. Uh, which, uh, which all are the main organizers uh, of the NYBC. And here you can see that over 100 and, that 170 sites were done just in the 2021 N uh, Taiwan NYBC. However, uh, that data is not out yet. But if you just look at the map here, it's around 13% of Taiwan that's covered by the NYBC. And so once the NYBC is done, it's not just kept within Taiwan here, but it's shared and you've got groups within Taiwan such as Academic Sinica, Jai University, National Taiwan University, as well as Union of Queensland in Australia. And also this data is contributed to Wetlands International's Asia Waterbird Census and uh, anyone else who's interested because it's all still put on open data. And if you look at the bottom there, starting in 2014, a uh, annual report is put out. And since 2019, we've had it in both English and Chinese. So if you're interested in any of these reports, you can ask and I would we'd be more than happy to share this information with you. And now some people ask us, uh, how exactly do you get the volunteers to stay interested in doing these kinds of uh, citizen science projects? And in fact, what I'm saying now about doing the NYBC is also applicable to many of the other uh, citizen science projects which we have here in Taiwan. So connecting, so at the TWBF, we work with the local bird societies and the local bird societies who have already been established, they work with each other and they serve as kind of like a backbone or a sort of networking system that operates between academics and, and maybe governments and other groups, local groups. And we try to get as and many people involved and through everyone knowing each other and talking about this activity, student groups in the wider community can get involved. We also work hard to have social media interactions, such as doing a Q&A, giving feedback to people. And last year, well, during the 2021 NYBC, we tried to do a hashtag. It's a work in progress. We're learning the <laughs> how to go and, and try and do more with the social media of it. We also created souvenirs, which I'll show you soon. And we had side events. 
such as like guess the magic number, uh, supporting student teams to do interesting surveys in places that are difficult to reach, normalizing it, trying to make the NYBC something that people have in their everyday, uh, in their, as an annual event saying, oh, it's the NYBC coming up. Okay, let's sign up, creating a reunion feeling. And then also doing annual reports, helping to put people's names within the articles that are put out about it, as well as creating popular science articles about the NYBC. And so here you could just see some of the uh, some of the swag, as I like to put it, for the NYBC. We create the stickers, and then there are uh, the bandanas, and also the couplets mixing the uh, culture, Taiwanese culture here, with uh, the NYBC in order to create these very beautiful spring couplets that combine the names of the birds with a Chinese idiom. So all these things make people interested and also make them a bit more excited as well about uh, the project coming up. And then as well, uh, another organization, which is the Raptor Research Group of Taiwan, yeah, they have been involved in doing raptor monitoring as a citizen science project alongside the Kending National Park staff since 2004. And that data is what went to the migratory raptors section of the SOTB. Now, in terms of the status and trends of specific bird species, you have the black-faced spoonbill, the black kite, northern lapwing, pheasant jacana, all of these have specific, uh, what sort of looking for? All of them have specific citizen science projects for uh, for them. And I mean, as I said before, using eBird data, people are able to go ahead and record any of these so that it helps us know where the birds are and what, may, what places they might be going to or, or, or using. And in the case of the russet sparrow, in the work doing in the work leading up to the russet sparrow studies, they looked at the eBird data and the Taiwan bird database information in order to uh, look at where they were historically using in terms of area. And now just uh, as one more uh, example of this, I just wanna talk about the blackface spoonbill. Blackface spoonbill surveys have been going on uh, since 1991 in, in Taiwan. Uh, the Council of Agriculture for Taiwan had hired one of Taiwan's big, biggest professors, uh, Mr. Wa Professor Wang Ying. And so he had done it with volunteers in 1991 for five years and they had done weekly, bi-weekly, and even monthly surveys. And then afterwards, once they were able to uh, join into the International Black Bay Spoonbill Census that was started in 1993-1994 with Tom Dahmer, they had they acted, they were very excited to go ahead and join. But these activities, and now the Black Bay Spoonbill Census, in fact, is organized by the by the TWBF in coordination with all of our local partners, especially the Wild Bird Society of Tainan and the Kaohsiung Wild Bird Society, as well as the other local bird societies and the Taiwan Blackface Spoonbill Conservation Association. So it's a very big group effort in order to go ahead and get these numbers, but it was very, very important in helping to uh, give information to the government and in order to influence policy towards protecting habitat for the wintering population of Blackface Spoonbill. And as you can see there in the chart, the number of wintering blackface boombill in Taiwan is, is around 50 to 60% of the global wintering population of blackface boombills. So if now we just look at the major conservation issues, uh, invasive bird species, especially in the case of the African sacred ibis and in minas, a lot of that data which they use in, in terms of influencing the policy comes from the eBird data or the information collected by everyday people collecting that information. In terms of addressing the poisoning crisis, citizen science, there's actually a Facebook group. Facebook groups are very popular in Taiwan for doing citizen science projects. And so reporting poisoning on the Facebook site has led to a movement amongst people and amongst local groups to go ahead and be able to better address the poisoning of raptor species in Taiwan. And so that is my presentation about citizen science and the role that people powered science plays here in Taiwan and especially for the SOTB. You can find us at the TWBF on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. And if you have any questions or would like to learn more about what I've talked about, please uh, feel free to get in contact with me. And again, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak today. Thanks so much for that, Scott. Fascinating stuff and uh, great to see so much stuff going on on the ground. One of the things that is changing in OBC is it's it's very much moving from being a uh, an English uh, run group of expats who are interested in things in Asia to actually being owned by members in, in Asia within region. And that's very much the direction of travel for OBC. So fantastic to hear all about that uh, from Taiwan and, and with so much data to boot. Thanks so much for that. Um,
Q&A is open. If you want to post questions for any of our speakers, uh, they can either answer by typing back to you uh, when they're not talking, or we can go to it at the end of this time. So if you want to ask questions, do please do it using the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, time now for our last speaker. Uh, we're going to go over to Glenn Valentine of Rock Jumper um, Birding Tours. Glenn's going to share with us some of the amazing birds that can be encountered uh, on a birding tour of Taiwan. Having been there, it's an amazing country and uh, I know just how great the birding can be. Um, and the birds you can see are thanks in no small part to some of the conservation efforts that we've been hearing about. Um, so uh, Glenn's speech is uh, simply entitled Bird Watching in Taiwan, Birding in Taiwan. Over to you, Glenn. Thanks so much, Chris. Really appreciate that. And thanks to all the previous speakers. And some really interesting information there. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for taking the time to join me today for my short presentation on the island of Taiwan. My slideshow today showcases the very best birding localities on the island, together with the many spectacular endemics and other special and range restricted birds that make Taiwan undoubtedly one of the absolute must visit birding destinations on Earth. Situated just off the southeast coast of mainland China, Taiwan offers some of the very best birding and scenery in all of Asia, and perhaps even on Earth. It is undoubtedly one of my favorite birding destinations, and I've been very fortunate to have led the majority of Rock Jumpers tours to the region since we started offering birding trips there in 2015. So without further ado, let's get stuck into our awesome Taiwan birding and wildlife itinerary, and some of the many highlights that we are to be enjoyed uh, during Rock Jumpers 12 day birding adventure that has been specially formulated together with the Oriental Bird Club for May 2022 as an exciting and unique fundraising birding event. Just uh, starting with a little bit of geography, as um, the guys have already mentioned, situated just off of East China, Taiwan's a, it's quite a small island, about 250 k's long and around 100 kilometers wide. Um, to the south of it lies the Philippines, and then slightly southwestwards, you've got Southeast Asian countries of Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia. And to the northeast there lies Japan. And uh, the southern islands of Japan, the Ryukyu Islands of Amami and Okinawa, actually come really close to the northeastern coast of Taiwan. Uh, that's just a general summary of, of the areas that we visit on our tour. The yellow spots highlight the destinations that we visit during the, the tour, quick fire 12-day 12, 12 tour, that uh, does quite incredibly go for every single possible Taiwan endemic, as well as all of the endemic subspecies. Um, a lot of these sites we only spend maybe a morning or an afternoon at. Other more concentrated areas like the Daswishan area require a, a full three days to cover that properly. And we'll be running through all of these sites coming up. Oh. So just a, a summary of, of some of Taiwan's really special birds. Um, they've got an incredible 28 currently recognized, sometimes 29 currently recognized Taiwan endemics. Some of my favorite and of, uh, often the client's favorites Birds include the magnificent swinnows and Mikado pheasants, um, the really tricky Taiwan partridge, Taiwan blue magpie that's absolutely spectacular, one of my favorites, beautiful yellow tits, an incredible seven endemic laughing thrushes, from true laughing thrushes all the way to Sibias and Bowings and Leah Sicklers, the immaculate flame crest, which is really one of the star birds of the entire trip, and one of my personal favorites, the collared bush robin. Um, an amazing 55 endemic subspecies too to the island and uh, many of them will likely be split in future as Taiwan endemics. They really are quite distinctive subspecies, geographically variable or variant and um, visually and even vocally distinct, but have not yet been described as full in Taiwan endemics. And then Another claim to fame for Taiwan and Taiwan's birding that makes it so special is that it's really one of the best places in the world to see a number of really tricky to find species otherwise in Southeast Asia. And um, most notably, as Dali was saying, the Malayan night heron is by far the best place to see it on earth is in Taiwan. But other tricky species like Chinese egret, egret are regularly seen. It's by far the best place on earth to see the widespread mountain scop salvin. A notoriously tricky bird to find anywhere else. Oriental Pratt and Coles are regular, 
wintering black-faced spoonbills are a real specialty and otherwise really only gettable in parts of Korea and Japan. And obviously really famous for their breeding fairy pitters, uh, one of only two spots globally for fairy pitter in the breeding season other than southern Japan. Uh, Vivan Altava is represented there as a distinctive subspecies and is a really tricky bird to find anywhere else in its range as well as Japanese paradise flycatcher, among numerous other cracking birds. And uh, yeah, let's get stuck into some other highlights. Yeah, we, not only just the birds, but some really fascinating mammals to spectacular mountain scenery throughout the trip with extensive, beautiful, pristine forests, an incredible network of extensive national parks to that cover a lot of, and protect a lot of Taiwan's beautiful montane evergreen forest as well as some lowland wetland sites. Um, the food is delicious. It's extremely safe and hospitable. The people are really friendly. I love Taiwanese people. They're always really happy to help and are so super informative and hospitable. Um, great road network, excellent infrastructure, good hotels. It's really organized. It, it feels in many respects like part of Japan or even these days parts of China, especially the Sichuan area. Uh, with a really modern infrastructure and ease of travel, great accommodations and a fascinating history to boot. So uh, to get stuck into some of the sites that we visit, uh, just highlighted here uh, in uh, little blue dots, these are just some of the, the core areas that we visit throughout the trip. You can see right basically the entire section of the country from the north through the interior, right into the south, west and south eastward areas, as well as the little offshore island of Lanyu. Uh, beginning the trip, uh, we start off in the Taipei Botanical Gardens and the northwest coastline, uh, right up here in the northwestern part of the country. Um, and it's a great introduction to some really good birding, a couple of endemics too, but just good general Asian birding and a lot of familiar species to get the trip going, but uh, very good for the Taiwan Scimitar babbler, which is a spectacular endemic species, similar to Himalaya's street breasted scimitar babbler. Pleasantly common, really vocal, but a really striking and attractive bird that's easily seen in the botanical gardens during our first outing to the, that part of the island. It's another great place to see the endemic Taiwan barbet, a recent split from the black browed barbet. Again, pleasantly common and vocal, and uh, Good photo ops await us in the Taiwan Botanical Gardens. It's also probably the best place to see the Malayan night heron, which can be seen elsewhere, but the photo ops and close encounters that we usually get in the Taiwan Botanical Gardens are um, really quite an amazing start to the trip and, and put everyone in really high spirits um, because it is really one of the a very tricky bird to see anywhere else in its range. You search for it so hard in some parts of a range like southern India or maybe northeast India and um, or Thailand and, and just virtually never ever encounter the species but it's so common and easy to find in Taiwan quite amazingly so. Uh, other more widespread birds that we might encounter in that area are the little feet vinous throated parrot bull. Everyone loves parrot bulls they're such cool little birds and one of my favorite groups of babblers and specific to Asia. Then we head up to the northwestern coastline and visit some beautiful coastal wetlands, settling ponds and freshwater pools. Uh, it, it forms a perfect way to spend the afternoon doing some wader watching and shore birding. And it also provides an excellent opportunity to see Chinese or Swinos egrets, sometimes even in full breeding plumage, which is another really tricky, to bird, tr tricky bird to find throughout the rest of its range in Asia as well as breeding plumage lesser and greater sand plovers, heaps of other waders, uh, you know, lots of red-necked and long-toed stints. Um, yeah, just scores and scores of waders. Sharp-tailed sandpipers are usually in large numbers there too. We might even see oriental pratt and coals. Just a good general suite of, of coastal species possible that afternoon. From Taipei, the capital, where we have started the trip. We then venture southwards just a short ways, maybe a half an hour drive into some beautiful forested hills uh, south of the capital city. And we'll spend the whole morning birding there, some excellent birding, and we really get stuck into some core Taiwan endemics in this part of 
the country, most notably the Taiwan blue magpie, a spectacular endemic that's uh, easiest sought in this part of the country in these forested foothills. But the general mixed species flocks are phenomenal. And uh, we, there'll be times where we won't know where to look. Uh, the birds absolutely pump in this area. Uh, lots of full vectors, euhinas, and a good, good area too for raptors. And the endemic great cheeked or Morrison's full vector with its really distinctive uh, white eye uh, spectacle uh, occurs in big mixed species flocks in the undergrowth and we'll certainly get good views of them in this area as well as the more widespread but beautiful rufous face warbler with its really distinctive telephone-like ringing song. Good area too for black necklace, scimitar babbler and as mentioned before a lot of different raptors in that area. Uh, dusky full vectors there too which is quite a tricky bird to find elsewhere. And uh, from the southern foothills of Taipei, we then drive uh, several hours up into the mountainous region and probably the core part of the entire trip to the Dasweshan area. It's an incredible part of the island that incorporates an area of altitude from about 500 meters in elevation all the way up to about three and a half thousand meters. So you, you've got about a, a nine, almost 10,000 feet elevation range that you cover in, in three full days in the Daswishen area. We'll be based in the lower parts of the road, but we'll cover all the various altitudes of the road. And it really is the core part of, of Taiwan's birding and offers the majority up to 80% of the, the island's endemic and sub endemic subspecies. Uh, the first afternoon we'll arrive and um, be treated to some spectacular scenery before getting stuck into some of the island's most spectacular endemic birds. Uh, one of my favorites, the Swinnows pheasant, here a male. Uh, it's, it's by far probably the best place to see it on the entire island. And um, we'll visit a, a little feeding station next to the road where uh, a pair or quite a few individuals of Swinnows pheasants usually come into the edge of the road and provide excellent views and photographic opportunities. The females, also quite a stunning bird and should show well during the afternoon, little stake out of this feeding station. It's also one of the best areas to see the endemic Steers leocicla, which like a lot of other Steers leociclas are quite tricky and secretive, um, but they regularly come to these little feeding stations and we should get some great views of them on the lower Dasvishan Road. As we venture a little bit higher up, we'll start seeing flocks of the beautiful endemic Taiwan Yuhina, as well as the widespread, but always tricky to see white-tailed robin. And Taiwan is undoubtedly one of the best places in the world to, to get really great views of the endemic subspecies of white-tailed robin. It's also an excellent area to see vivid Noltava, another endemic subspecies on Taiwan with a slightly different call and plumage, and a very tricky bird to find elsewhere in its range as well as um, white-backed or if split Austin's woodpeckers. They're sometimes around but occurred fairly low density. And along the little forested streams, we'll look for little forktail, also widespread in Asia, but never easy to find. And such a great little family, the forktails or, or sub subfamily rather. Um, but it's the higher stretches of the road that really have uh, a lot of juicy endemics in store for us. Heaps of different laughing thrushes from Buffy to this white whiskered laughing thrush that occurs in large roving flocks through the forest undergrowth. The very rare rufous crown laughing thrush is also possible, as well as Taiwan barwing, yellow tits. Um, so it's a really tricky endemic, white-eared sibia, which is a, a, a gorgeous bird and also endemic to the island. And then right up in the highest elevation of the road, we'll be treated to confiding Taiwan bullfinches as well as Taiwan rose finches, very recent splits of more widespread species like gray headed bullfinch and venaceous rose finch, um, a beautiful and, and very recently recognized Taiwan endemics. Uh, also, a number of great mammals to be seen, um, especially during the nighttime. We'll do little night forays in search of mountain scopsail, but uh, a lot of endemic flying squirrels possible. We'll see these cute little Formosan striped squirrels during the day. Uh, Pernies long-nosed squirrels are usually around and Formosan macaques are sometimes around. A, a good, good suite and range of, of mammals to keep us interested too while we enjoy the, the spectacular endemic birds of Taiwan. And the last morning we'll venture lower down uh, below our hotel and the lower stretches of the Dasweshan Road. 
And Birds of Forest Edge, where the birding is particularly rewarding and easy and we'll get to grips with more widespread species like brown dippers, plumbeous red starts that are always a favorite, and the fairly localized colored finch bull, a type of bulbul that occurs at the forest edge, as well as gray tree pies, usually quite noisy and obtrusive in that area. Leaving the, uh, the gorgeous Dustwishan area in the center of the country, we then drive for most of the afternoon into the evening uh, before finally arriving at the Budai wetlands just north of Tainan and then uh, eventually onto the Agu wetlands where we'll spend the next morning. But yeah, based in the southwestern city of Tainan for a one night stay. Uh, in this area, we'll search for a couple of straggling black faced spoonbills. The, the timing will be in spring in May to coincide with fairy pitters and the onset of the call and songs of most of the Taiwanese endemics. But there are usually still quite a few winter visitors hanging around like uh, black faced spoonbills. And we usually connect with a few of these very sought after and range restricted and endangered species in the, in the Tainan area. Uh, uh, oriental Pratt and Coles usually show very well here and, and, and provide some great photo ops. And another tricky bird to find anywhere else in its range. We'll also visit the the pheasant tail jacana sanctuary where breeding plumage pheasant tail jacanas usually perform fantastically well for excellent photo ops and here we'll also search for greater painted snipe never an easy bird to find and, and always a beautiful and very special species in a family that where there's only three representatives worldwide from tainan and tainan just it, it provides a great spread of general coastal birds, um, both waders, shorebirds, wetland species. So just it provides a great afternoon and mornings birding. Um, very few endemics or, or, or localized regional specialties, but, but some, some great birds like black faced spoonbill and, and more widespread species. But from there, we, we head down just for a one night stay in the Pintung area, right down here in the south eastern corner of the island. And the main reason that for going there is to, to try and locate the endemic subspecies of maroon oriole that's often split as a Taiwan endemic, the red oriole, an absolutely spectacular glowing red and black oriole that if split would be one of the toughest birds to find on the island. And that's the main reason for, for going to the Pintung area. It's also a great area though to find Taiwan bamboo partridge, which is really tricky to find elsewhere and a good backup site for Malayan night heron, as well as a number of other slightly more widespread birds. From the Pingtung area, we then head right to the southern tip of the island to the Long Luang uh, Wetland Reserve, a national park near Kenting, uh, where we'll spend a morning searching for one very localized Taiwan endemic, the Steins bulbul. Doesn't really look like much, and it's kind of reminiscent of a Suti bulbul or sooty cap bulbul crossed between an ashy bulbul but very distinctive and unique with this uh, black moustachial stripe and exceedingly localized not only is it endemic to Taiwan but it only occurs in a tiny area of the southeastern part of the country. From Kenting we then board a ferry and take a two and a half hour ferry ride that's very pleasant and very organized and while appointed, we, we head over to Lanyu Island, which is almost more of a Filipino feel to it than Taiwan. A, a lot of Philippine birds come in there, and a lot of southern Japan birds get in there, birds that otherwise only occur in the Ryukyu Islands of southern Japan. And we'll spend a night there searching for some very special birds. Brown eared bulbul is a little bit more widespread, but it's pleasantly common, and we'll get to grips with them there. Uh, whistling or Lanyu green pigeon occurs in reasonable numbers and is otherwise restricted to the Ryukyu Islands of Japan. And uh, we usually manage to locate roosting Ryukyu scopsel, the endemic subspecies sometimes splits as Lanyu scopsel, as well as northern bubuk, which can be a really tricky bird to find elsewhere outside of Japan. And uh, Japanese paradise flycatchers are usually around, Philippine. Um, Cuckoo dove usually puts in an appearance and we even often find uh, one or two vagrant species. We've, we've seen Japanese yellow bunting there before on passage, which is a really tricky bird to find elsewhere. And Lanyu always provides some really good and, and rather easy, nice lowland forest edge birding. Um, and then it's time to head back to the mainland 
ferry crossing is then in the late morning and, and that provides our best chance of some seabirds and to, to catch up with some tricky seabirds worldwide like bullwhist petrel that's usually put in an appearance on a couple of occasions as well as uh, migratory or on passage street shear waters before heading back to Kenting and driving for the most of the rest of the afternoon up back into the interior to the small mid-altitude little town of Huben and the center for Ferry Pitta in Taiwan, taken on, on a previous trip by a colleague of mine, Rich. Um, this is an incredible shot of the bird. We, we almost, well, we have always managed to get to grips with Ferry Pitta in this part of the world and on this trip. We've never missed it yet, but they're never usually tricky. But we work in conjunction with a couple of local guys that usually have a nesting site or a really good aerial territory. We will manage to locate the bird in a full day's birding there. And then every now and then you get blown away with incredible sightings like this bird carrying food to the nest. We coincide the trip quite specifically to connect with Fairy Pitta which uh, can be seen from the end of April, but May is usually the peak time and then into early June but a small about six week window period where you can see this iconic and really beautiful pitta. There's a, a little cafe that we visit there and the Huban population are really proud and, and fond of their pittas and they dedicate a lot to pitta conservation and pitta awareness. We'll visit this, this cool little cafe um, dedicated to the fairy pitta where there's fairy pitta signs everywhere. It's actually called the pitta cafe there uh, with statues of fairy pittas and big postcards and there's this little garden. It's a great place to get a coffee or tea, have a little bite to eat um, between birding sessions. Um, it's so much so is dedicated to the fairy pit that even the uh, the restrooms have a little pit on the wall. From uh, Huben and our full day there, we'll then head up back into the mountains to the lower Alishan area, beautiful part of the, the country, really scenic, and we'll pass by a number of old temples and historic sites we will spend a little bit of time um, enjoying them and, and often provide a roosting collared scopsal in one of these temples. From there we head up uh, into high elevation forests and some really pristine areas looking for more endemics. A lot of overlap with the endemics of the Dasweshan area in this, in this area, but it, it's a, a particularly good for area to see the, the decreasing in numbers, Taiwan borrowing a beautiful but really tricky endemic to find and also very good for for Taiwan short wing and a number of other great Taiwan endemics. We finally arrive at our beautiful accommodation set at the edge of a coffee plantation and forest edge in the Alishan area and in the afternoon we'll then duck into the forest along the forest trail into a little hide that almost always produces fantastic views of this really special endemic and really striking Taiwan partridge and almost impossible to bird to find anywhere else on the island away from this one specific little area and the little hide where they put out mealworms to attract the partridges and besides the partridge we usually acquire good views again of Swinnow's pheasants right in the forest interior in their more typical habitat as uh, and it also provides a decent chance for the endemic subspecies of scaly thrush that sometimes spit as Taiwan thrush, a really tricky bird to find anywhere else. And sometimes even the endemic sub white-headed subspecies of island thrush in this area. From Ali Shan, we then venture a little bit higher up into the mountains to Yushan National Park. And again, a lot of overlap with Daswe Shan endemics and birds. And so backup chances for a lot of the species already mentioned earlier in, in the itinerary. Uh, but Yushan National Park provides spectacular scenery, fantastic birding, and a great full day's birding there. It should produce Taiwan borrowing along with most of the other core mountain endemics. From uh, Yushan, we then head up a little bit further north to Wuxie in the Taroko National Park that also provides fantastic mountain scenery. And uh, we'll visit the Hehuan Pass, which is the highest elevation point of our trip as well as the legendary Blue Gate track. Some of the scenery on the way to Taroko National Park, looking over the lowlands towards northern Taiwan. Um, and there's right at the top in the national park itself and above the tree line here at about 10,000 feet is the ideal area to look for Mikado pheasant, as well as Taiwan bullfinch, Taiwan rosefinch, 
fire uh, flame crest and um, yeah, a lot of other great endemic birds. Beautiful scenery, great birding. We'll bird a couple of little glades of bamboo understory for the endemic subspecies of golden parrot bull too, as well as the endemic subspecies of white brown bush robin that looks completely different and has a very different call to mainland white brown bush robins and is very often split as somber bush robin. Uh, Taiwan yellow-bellied bush warbler, not an endemic species yet, but very likely to be split in future, is often in attendance in the higher altitude coniferous and mixed bamboo forests. And it's an excellent place to see collared bush robin, which you probably will have already seen, but who gets tired of such a, a beautiful little endemic bird. That's the female type collared bush robin, uh, quite different looking, but also quite attractive. And she can be quite showy sometimes. But uh, the Hevine Pass, we will visit one afternoon, will be the place to see Taiwan bush warbler that's recently been stripped from russet bush warbler further afield and a very localized held high altitude Taiwan endemic. Alpine accenters are usually around. It's uh, far more widespread elsewhere, but always a great bird to find and very localized in Taiwan, as well as the endemic subspecies of spotted nutcracker. And one of the, bird, the, the island's most iconic birds, a tricky bird to, to photograph, but we usually acquire some fantastic views of the endemic flame crest the male with its bright orange feathers just lying underneath a black crown that they often raise in, um, in display for the surrounding females when they bright, raise these bright orange feathers that have, it's almost never been photographed. I think Dali had a, had a photograph of one in his start of his presentation that I, I was actually quite taken aback at. I've never seen a photograph like that before of flame crest. And when you do get to see them like that, which you often do during May, they are just the most exquisite little birds in the kinglet family, along with flame crest, uh, fire crest, and gold crest as well, and a couple of South American counterparts. And from there, we pretty much end the trip and just head back towards Taipei and uh, fire a, a low elevation valley, which is virtually the only place where we might see chestnut belly tit, another really localized Taiwan endemic. But yeah, all in all, an amazing trip, one of my favorites, and um, in quite an incredible area where you can get literally every single endemic and endemic subspecies, as well as a wealth of other fantastic birds during just a, a short, quick five, 12 day trip around the island. Thank you so much, everyone. Really enjoyed uh, sharing that with you. And uh, yeah, thanks on to you, Chris. Brilliant. Thanks so much for that, Glenn. Uh, I want to go back now. That was uh, just so, uh, so fantastic. So many good memories for me of when I was there and, uh, yeah. and a few birds that I, I still need, especially all of these pending splits. Uh, it's uh, amazing birding and genuinely, as, as Glenn has said, uh, lovely people. I had such a good time there. Um, it really is a fantastic destination. Thanks again, Glenn. Um, that's it for our speakers today. We're going to try and do a couple of questions quickly. Um, just before that, uh, to remind you, if you'd like to make a donation to OBC, just go to orientalbirdclub.org forward slash donate. Um, and if you'd like to join OBC, if you're not a member already, uh, just go to uh, orientalbirdclub.org forward slash join. Um, and you can, uh, with a couple of clicks, um, join membership there. Um, I think we're going to try and go uh, live to one of the people who've asked a question. Uh, Mike, are you able to go live to Terry Townsend so Terry can ask a question? This will be a first, actually. We've never tried to go live to a question asker before, so we're going to find out whether we can do it or not in real time. Terry, if you can uh, hear us, go ahead. Go ahead. Great. Um, yeah, thank, first of all, thanks to OBC for organising this um, webinar and also thanks to the speakers uh, who gave a, a really fantastic overview of uh, birds of Taiwan and um, I too have experienced the wonderful birding in Taiwan and have great memories and the, you know fantastic people amazing hospitality and incredible birds so so uh, really thank you for that my question was really uh, I was very impressed with the status of Taiwan's birds I think it's a really great example of how citizen science, individual birders records can really contribute to a significant report that sort of outlines uh, the conservation status of birds to highlight priorities for um, engaging with governments. You know, it's really powerful to have that sort of evidence base. 
to be able to do that in terms of conservation priorities. Um, and I just wondered if there was a role for OBC perhaps to um, put together some sort of blueprint for how to do a status of X's birds you know, for uh, other countries and regions uh, in OBC's area of interest. Um, because I, I really think that promoting this, this model could be really powerful uh, for promoting conservation with, with relevant governments and authorities. So that was just a sort of observation based on the presentation that we've seen today. So thank you. Yeah, great idea, Terry. Um, it's not something we've done in the past. Um, we could start with China and you could help us with that. So uh, that'd be a, a small project for you to get on with. But uh, as you say, make a great template. So uh, we'll, uh, I'll ask council to talk about that at the next council meeting. Uh, maybe we can learn from, from what they've done in Taiwan, you know, how, how, how they've done that, sort of their methodology, um, so that we can we can build on that and you know, help transfer that to others. Great. Yeah, great idea. Uh, thanks for that, Terry. Um, I've got a question for um, Scott. Uh, is there a place where we can see a list of bird species listed by when they are here? Like, for example, a list of the 13 summer visitors. Is there a website or is eBird the best? Or Well, e well on the uh, state of Taiwan's birds and also with the, uh, the red list, we've broken down the different bird species in Taiwan so that you, we have the different summer visitors or breeding birds, things like that. However, that's very general and also more scientific. One of the best places you could go to is eBird. Uh, and on eBird, now they have the function where you can go ahead and see what birds should be in a place at a certain time. And so knowing that which birds you might be looking for might be very, very helpful for that. Or if you are interested in taking a trip, then consulting with somebody like Glenn, who, uh, who would know about the different kinds of birds at different times would, would be helpful. Great, thanks for that. Um, Mike, I think you were gonna try and go live to Dick Philby to get to, so we could hear Dick's question. Is yeah, Dick, 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 I'm gonna ask that on, um, on behalf of Dick. Uh, so thanks Dick for your question. Uh, and this is aimed for, for Dali really. And what's the story with Oriental turtle dove uh, increase? Uh, we've seen a 96% decrease of turtle dove in, in the UK, but uh, it seems that Oriental turtle dove is on the, actually on the increase in Taiwan. And, Want to know what your thoughts are on that, really? Okay, thank you for these questions. Um, and don't have the um, empirical data to support this question, but like the um, Oriental turtle dove is very common in Taipei or North Taiwan, and it's especially in urban areas. And sometimes they are just uh, breeding um, on the on the canopy of the penetrant tree, or sometimes they just a breeding on the balcony. So I'm sure they are very adapted to the urban area environment in Taiwan. I'm not very sure um, the rabbit drop in UK. So maybe the, the two different populations may have faced to different threat in different environment for their survival shift and reproduction. Great, thanks for that, Dali. Um, I'm just going to try and fit in one more question. I know we're kind of running out of time, but uh, question for Glenn. Um, Michael Olson asks, seeing birds is often a function of weather. Given that, what are the best months of the year to visit Taiwan for birding? I'd like to say from past experience and, and from the fact that we've um, done so much homework into trying to find that out over the years, the, when we run the trip in May is an excellent time. It, you, you could encounter a little bit of uh, rain here and there. It's not unusual any time from about April right through to, gosh, August. But after about June, it becomes very wet. So the winter period of sort of the end of April, but through May, maybe into the first week of June is a perfect winter period where you're usually going to encounter good weather. It's starting to warm up. Uh, for the most part, and but you could you could get a little bit of drizzle, um, but mostly at night. Um, winter is also an excellent time. In fact, for for weather, if purely weather is a big issue for you, and you're not really too phased by what birds you see, winter is a fantastic time to do the trip too. Um, it's it's a lot colder for sure, but um, yeah, less chance of rain, and all of the resident birds are still available. A, a lot of winter visitors are around. You won't get things like fairy pitta and, and a couple of other specialties that I mentioned, but it, it does 
offer some great birding with, with good weather. But otherwise, the springtime, April, May, is your best, best season for, for weather. Great, thanks, Glenn. Uh, which, of course, fits perfectly with the OBC sponsored tour next year. If you didn't get those dates at the end of Glenn's presentation, it is 7th to 18th of May. Uh, 2022, so peak season time. Uh, the best birding in Taiwan with Rock Jumper, uh, the experts, and of course ABC will benefit um, from every tour participant. If you want details on the tour, you can find them at rockjumperbirding.com or on the Oriental Bird website. Uh, I think we're pretty much out of time today for um, other questions. So it just remains to me to say thank you very much to all our speakers today. Uh, some fascinating insights to uh, lots of different aspects of, of birds and birding in Taiwan. So thank you all very much uh, indeed. Um, our next seminar, uh, the date's still to be confirmed, but it's going to be on the Asian songbird trade. I know there were a couple of questions on cage birds uh, and, and the plight of songbirds in Asia that came in that we didn't have time to get to today, but we are going to dedicate the next uh, webinar to that. So uh, on that exciting note, uh, watch out for that. We'll post details on ABC social media as usual. Um, but for now, we're all going to sign off and say thank you for joining us and uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks again to our speakers. Thanks all.